Our uh, first guest in this segment of the program is Delegate Mike Pushkin. Pushkin, he is the uh, party chair for the Democratic Party in the state of West Virginia. Michael, good morning to you. Good morning. It's good to hear you all. Great to have you with us, sir, once again. And uh, curious to get your reaction to the governor's State of the State address on Wednesday night. Well, yeah, you know, unlike uh, uh, most of the governor's uh, State of the State addresses that I've attended, and I've attended all of them. I think this might have been the first one with, with uh, no props, uh, no cameo appearances by uh, you know, either Shaquille O'Neal or Baby Dog. It was... Uh, a girls' basketball know, it was, team. It, it, what's that? A girls' basketball team. Yeah, yeah. A girls' basketball Yeah, usually there's a prop or a special guest. Yeah. But th- th- not only was it lacking that, which uh, that was fine, but uh, really short on details, uh, the, it... it yeah, the governor, there was a, a promises of a lot of new spending, a whole lot of new spending, uh, coupled with a uh, huge tax cut, um, which I just don't – I'd, I'd love to see the math on this. It just doesn't seem to add up. Although we found out yesterday, after he said he failed to mention that he was going to use over $700 million of the surplus to offset uh, the uh, personal income tax uh, reduction. Um, to me, that's it's using you know one-time money to pay for an ongoing expense. That, that's not you know sound uh, you know fiscal policy. Uh, so I was disappointed in a lot of the lack of detail. Uh, there, a lot of the speech I, I did uh, really I liked that he brought up uh, you know the noble uh, goal of ending hunger in West Virginia. I think that's something everybody could support. He said, said he was going to put ten million towards our food banks. Uh, I'm definitely in favor of that. Uh, I was glad that he talked about a uh, cost of living adjustment for our, our you know, Republican retirees, um, although the adjustment was not uh, nearly enough. These folks have been living below the poverty level for quite some time. There's a threat of their of their insurance premiums going going up with PEIA, and he said he was going to raise it uh, to 1000 with a $1,500 bonus, one-time bonus. Uh, that's not nearly enough. Uh, just basically, the, the, the speech was very short on detail, uh, very big on promises. It sounded to me like a campaign speech. Yeah, his state of the state addresses, I think, for the most part, tend to be short on detail, though, don't they? Yes. Uh, yeah, most of them, yeah. yeah. Actually, all of them. Yeah, they, they're all short on detail. The governor also promised that 5% pay raise for all state employees. And I asked this question yesterday. We had uh, Senate President Blair on, House Majority Leader Eric Householder. Uh, we've done three 5% raises with this proposed fourth one. Why does it have to be a 5% raise? Why can't it be more than that, Mike? Well, actually, I, I would, I'd be interested to hear what uh, the majority leader, how he answered that. But it doesn't have to be. You know, the, the legislature uh, controls the power of the purse, and we're the ones that, that set uh, these rates uh, for public employees uh, in the budget each year. I would hope the legislature gives an even bigger raise because with it to offset the the, you know, the cost of, of everything these days with the rate of inflation, I think that uh, our public employees uh, deserve more of a raise. The governor also uh, mentioned... You know, especially up in your area where you're yes. competing with uh, Virginia and Maryland. Which leads me into my next point. The governor, I was pleased to see, mentioned locality pay because of the drain that goes on in border counties where neighboring states have uh, higher payrolls, uh, salaries that they can dole out, such as we experience here in the Eastern Panhandle. Is locality pay or some workaround for that that sounds more appeasing across the state doable, Mike? Uh, yeah, I, I hope we we're able to look at it. I, I think it's, I mean, I understand the issues that you all have up there, where you're competing with two states that they're treating their public employees a lot better than we are, you know, especially in regards to uh, not just for teachers, but also you know, correctional officers. We have staffing shortages all over in the public sector. And um, I'm, you know, we're willing to work on, on any uh, workable solution uh, to address that. And uh, so, yeah, I'm glad that that's on the table. Bill. Uh, Good morning, Michael. Uh, Bill Stubblefield. Uh, You mentioned this $700 million. I heard David Hardy yesterday speak to that, and uh, it was not an offset as much as as an insurance policy should something not work out as well as they hope to with the uh, uh, the income tax reduction. According to Hardy, they, uh, the numbers would suggest they have the numbers to make it uh, work, but the $700 million was strictly an insurance policy, at least according to him. 
Well, I, you know, I can say going out and buying a Mega Millions ticket yeah. this morning is an insurance <laughs> policy as well. Uh, Which I have done, by the way. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll probably do, yeah, do that yeah, at some yeah. point today as well. Yeah. I, I, to me, the, 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 the math just doesn't add up. When mm-hmm. the governor proposed uh, all, you know, all these uh, different programs of uh, new spending um, and then a, yeah, a huge tax cut um, and based on – on uh, uh, these uh, numbers that have, I mean, they also, during the uh, finance committee, I believe yesterday, from how, the, how these numbers are, are really artificial, these uh, estimates that they, they, could, they, you know, they can lowball the estimates and say, well, we have a surplus. Um, to me, it's just not sound fiscal policy. I'm not saying that we would oppose, uh, you know, everybody is for putting money back in people's pockets right now. Um, there's a, there's a way to do that. I just want we would like to do it in a way that's more more responsible, uh, and to offer all these you know, huge spending programs along with yeah. But we're going to you know cut taxes and take a, a billion out of the budget. It, it doesn't make any. It doesn't add up. Yeah, I I had a sense same sense you did. I felt that Governor Justice was using the state of the state as a um, as his first step for running for the Senate, and he he was providing a lot of promises. Uh, let me shift a little bit to the mechanics of the workings going on with the legislators. Uh, the Senate, uh, according to uh, President Blair, uh, has suspended the rules and passed 23 bills uh, from the Senate to the House. Uh, and the uh, and Senator Blair's argument was these are bills that were discussed in years past or actually been passed last year. There were a lot of Democratic bills as well as Republican bills. You you, as uh, uh, one of the leaders in the Democratic Party, do you support the suspending the rules and passing uh, block number of bills over at one time? No, I absolutely do not. I couldn't disagree with the actions of the Senate more. Uh, I, I think we put out a release saying, uh, actually calling it the death of transparency and accountability in the Senate. And while, yes, some of those bills, the majority of those bills have run before. Some of those were new bills where there were some slight changes or actually some major changes to some of them. Uh, in regards to the bill that, that uh, divides the DHHR, uh, I, th- I believe last year the bill that was vetoed, it, it divided the DHHR into two departments. This new bill divides into uh, three departments. Um, there was a bill in there about critical race theory. It's very uh, uh, you know, a uh, yeah, hot-button uh, item, a bill there. Um, whether we support the actual bills or not, whether it's a good bill, whether it's a bill we think it's a bad bill, they all deserve a process. And while they might have been voted on before, this is the 86th legislature. You have a record number of new senators. We have a record number of new delegates. Um, their constituents uh, deserve a voice in, in the the in the. You know, the deliberation of these bills, those senators deserve the ability to make amendments to those bills, to learn more about those bills. I, I think there was – I don't understand the need to rush the process on day one. And, um, and not only I mean, does it cut the, the, the newly elected legislators out of the process, more importantly, it cuts the people out of the process. There's less time for the people to learn what's, what's in this legislation and, and speak up and contact uh, their senators – and uh, and let them know their thoughts on the bill uh, eliminates any kind of any kind of public input at all. Yeah, uh, the argument that um, uh, President Blair used was to uh, give the House a, a more a longer opportunity, a larger opportunity to look at these bills. But yet, it's my I've been told, and you're much closer to it than I am, that uh, prior to crossover day, most of the action is looking at those bills in the House itself or in the Senate itself that's been generated. And it's only after crossover day do you seriously look at those bills that's introduced. By the other body is that correct you're absolutely correct um they will not take up i, I, I do not see the house taking up uh senate bills before crossover day unless it is a bill that they would uh be concerned about a veto um it, i've seen that when bills are rushed through if they, if they sense there's going to be a veto so to make sure that the legislature is still in session uh when the governor you know, refuses to sign the bill and then we could uh, override that while we're still in session uh, but no it's rare that we take up senate bills before crossover day and a lot of those bills uh, there are house versions 
of those bills as well. In many cases, you have a House version, you have a Senate version, same bill. And you know, to to the speak to Speaker Hanshaw's credit, uh, our bills uh, will go through the process. They'll go through the committees. Uh, we will, you know, have everybody will have a chance to offer amendments. It'll be debated on the floor of the House, uh, and you know, the public can request public hearings uh, in the House. Uh, so they, you know, they say the Senate's supposed to be the most deliberative body uh, in in the in the state. Well, they proved that they're not because they didn't uh, have any deliberation on these bills. Just you know, shoving a stack of bills through on the first day is just not good government. It, it's a lack of accountability, and it's just you know, closing the door on transparency. And, and the fact that, in all probability, these bills will not be looked at until crossover day uh, leads one to ask the question: What was the urgency of suspending the rules to get them uh, get them passed to the House? So. Well, that would be a great question for uh, Senate President right. Blair. Exactly, yeah. Uh, to me, it looked more like it was for show. Mm-hmm. Craig, yesterday when we did have him on, made a point to say all of those bills, I think he said all of them, were bills that had already passed last year but just didn't make it through the finish line. So they've already gone through the entire process, uh, that this was not an unusual act. This happens, you know, I guess more than just this year it's happened, where these bills that have not made it through the finish line that have already been read three times, vetted, gotten through the process. You just introduce them early on and take care of it that way. Well, the the, the, the bill to split the DHHR was, was very different clearly. than what passed last year. was clearly different. And I'd say, again, they passed, uh, they made it, <laughs> they went through the process in the 85th legislature. This is the 86th legislature. We have a lot of new members and I believe they deserve to be part of the process. More importantly, their constituents deserve to be part of the process. Mike, you mentioned the new members. If you remember back to when you were new at this, how long does it take a new member to get, uh, I guess, an understanding of what's really going on in Charleston and function as someone who can think independently and make decisions? Um, yeah, it, it does take a, a, a bit of time to uh, to learn the process. Um, I think some maybe a little longer uh, than others. Um, yeah, but uh, I think I would hope everybody can come up and be an independent thinker. Uh, I, I I might have broke a record. Uh, my my first day in, in uh, January of of uh, 2015, um, I, I uh, offered an amendment to the uh, to the rules of the House. Uh, of course, it failed, but I uh, got up on my first day and tried to amend the rules of the House. Um, so it, it you know, the, you have some time between November and, uh, and January to, uh, to read up, learn the rules. So that was the best piece of advice that somebody, a former legislator gave me after I was elected. He said, get the book and learn the rules. What is it like being a member of a 12 strong minority in the Capitol? Well, we're a tight knit group. <laughs> <laughs> it's like being in a, uh, you know, it's a foxhole with 11 of your best friends. Uh, it, we're going to be working together. And uh, I think, I believe uh, Delegate Hornbuckle said it best yesterday. We had a press conference and he said, you know, we're, we plan on being the adults in the room. And uh, I, I think that we, we need to provide a, a voice of, uh, of, of, of reason a lot of times with, with us, the, the super duper majority, whatever we're going to call it. There's uh, not uh, uh, a whole lot of consideration of, of, other viewpoints but it needs to be there and i've said this before too but with you know with 12 of us out of 100 that's 12 percent over in the senate three that's around nine percent i don't think that's reflective of the state i think that's due to gerrymandering it's definitely due to gerrymandering that the that a lot of the seats that were picked up uh i'm not uh, the point i'm trying to make is if it's reflective of the uh the state it would roughly be a we're, i'm not saying we're anywhere near a blue state well, we're probably around a third, maybe a little bit more than a third of the state are, are Democrats. I think that that gives us a tougher job to do because we're actually uh, speaking for a, a lot more people than we have uh, than, than we have represented up there. So our, our our work is cut out for us. But I think that we're actually speaking for about a third of the state, not 12 percent of it. You mentioned you think that the lines were redrawn in a gerrymandered way. So the 12 of you that survived, do you regard those as 12 safe Democratic seats or are the 12 of you who are surviving 
uh, some of you may be 50-50 to return the next time in two years. Well, I'd hope we have, oh, we come back with a, a lot more than 12. I don't like to regard any seat as, uh, as necessarily safe. I think that we need to uh, do our job and be accountable to the people that sent us up here and be accessible to our constituents. Uh, so uh, I don't uh, I'd like to think of it as as safe. I think we're going to uh, you know, do our job and try to, and those of us who seek re-election will, will earn uh, that honor from uh, from our constituents. I haven't looked, but maybe, maybe you know as the state party chair, who is the closest to the Eastern Panhandle elected Democrat remaining in the House, Mike? Closest to the eastern panhandle, it must be, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it's probably in Mon County. Oh, wow, that's a yeah, good distance. Quite a ways, yeah. yeah, Bill? Yeah, uh, you mentioned the 12 and then the adults in the room. Uh, I have never worked with Roger, Roger Hanshaw, but my impression is that he is more inclusive uh, and including people with with good ideas. Do you sense that you will be able to work with a speaker uh, if you have a good idea, a good proposal? Yeah, we've always been able to do yeah. that. And then it's already started. I've already met with some of the committee chairs. I know some of our members, other members of our caucus have met uh, with their committee chairs and have brought some just good bipartisan ideas, ideas that don't have a D or an R after them. And uh, you know, we might it might be uh, a better strategy to have somebody else introduce the bill or have put somebody else's name on the bill, but we will uh, get a lot of our proposals through uh, because they're not going to be political; they're more based on policy and just uh, you know good ideas that'll help uh, benefit and improve the lives of our constituents. Uh, so yeah, I'm optimistic about that. I've always had a good working relationship, not just with Speaker Hanshaw, but with uh, many members of his leadership team. Yeah, but it, and, it, and, uh, and it occurs to me, at least the impression I have, is that uh, Roger Henshaw actually promotes as much uh, uh, bipartisan work as possible, trying to, obviously there's political boundaries, but he tries to promote the bipartisan efforts. Yeah, he, he has always been good about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to his credit, Senate, uh, Senate President Blair mm -hmm. uh, has also uh, worked with many of the Democrats over the years in the Senate, uh, if, if it's a good idea that, um, that they you know, said in that first uh, bundle of bills they pushed through, there were several that had lead sponsors that were Democrats or at least uh, former Democrats. Well, good. Good. Mike, there was, as you said, a lot of spending in the governor's proposal and uh, it was for a wide variety of uh, items. In regards to some of that spending, is there any that sticks out for you as necessary? Well, I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, I strongly support the proposal to put $10 million, uh, to our food banks and with the goal of eliminating hunger in, in West Virginia. I always felt that in, you know, in this, you know, here in the greatest country in the world, that especially no children should be going hungry. Uh, so I applaud the governor on that. I, I, we also support the pay raise for public employees. Uh, I don't feel it's enough, uh, so we support the uh, cost of living adjustment for public retirees. That is imperative. That is what I hear more than anything from uh, many of my constituents. I have a lot of constituents who are retired public employees, and they haven't had a cost of living adjustment in a long time. He said we've done uh, – this would be the, the third pay raise for public employees since the governor has been in office. We haven't uh, addressed our retirees and given them a cost of living adjustment. You know, he said that he would he was going to raise it to a thousand. That means many of them are living under a thousand dollars a month. Who can live on that? Uh, that's what they have fixed. I mean, that's the, the, they're living on these fixed incomes, and then there's the threat of their of their premiums going up. Uh, they're not going to be able to live like that. That's a serious serious issue. I strong. I would you know I support um, <laughs> a cost of living adjustment for retirees, but I think it should be much more generous than what the governor has offered. Um, he mentioned broadband, uh, $1 billion program, half of which has been spent. Is he proposing additional money going into broadband? See, I don't know what – I'd have to really look and see what the proposal was. A lot of times with the governor, too, he just – he just mentions it. I mean, he's like, you know, we're, was, I thought it was just paying lip service to. We were the worst, uh, the, as far as the drug ep epidemic in West Virginia. We've been hit harder than any other state. 
he just mentioned uh, it was like a, he put a sentence in there about just so he could check it off a box, it seemed like. But he didn't really say what he was going to do about the drug problem. Same with the problems at the DHHR. Let's talk about that. We've had these issues with the DHHR for quite some time. He was correct in saying they didn't happen overnight. It didn't all happen on his watch. But this is the first time he's really even mentioned it with some of these problems at the DHHR. Um, you know, he's had his cabinet secretary, who's been in there uh, for what now seven years or so, <laughs> who has recently been forced to step down because of just the the mess that's going on in that huge department and this uh, toxic culture uh, in, in this in this huge department. And when this department is failing, uh, we are failing children in foster care. We are failing you know families who have loved ones with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Uh, we're failing the residents of our state hospital. Like, there's a lot of very vulnerable people that are affected by the failings of the DHHR. And this is the first time the governor's really even paid any kind of attention to it, is simply because they had to remove a cabinet secretary over it. Yeah, uh, he, these are the types of issues that we that we need to be addressing. He meant, One thing that the governor... Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Didn't... Well, I wanted to get to this. One thing that bothered... One of the many things that bothered me about the speech was he talked about using the American Rescue Plan money. And that's money that was, you know, passed by all Democratic votes in Congress, signed into law by a Democratic president who he failed to, to thank for this money. He slammed uh, the Biden administration and Democrats in, in Congress at the beginning of his speech and then talked about he, how he was going to misuse, misuse the American Rescue Plan money and spend up over a half a billion dollars to put it in the economic, economic impact fund. That is not what that money was meant for. I talked about some of the issues of the DHHR. <laughs> a lot of those are really deep-seated issues in our in our society here in West Virginia that could be addressed with that money, not putting the money directly into the DHHR, but putting that money into programs that actually help the people that the DHHR is trying to serve. Whether it's you know these families who have gone through uh, gone through something and wind up having children in the in the system, or these families that have. Uh, um, uh, loved ones with uh, intellectual and developmental di- developmental disabilities. The money from the American Rescue Plan is meant to help communities that are in distress and have been the most affected by the pandemic. That's what that money was meant for. The best use of that money, I would say, would be to circumvent the state, circumvent the DHHR, send it back to the municipalities, send it back to the counties where there are no municipalities, and they know where the where the money is best spent and get that money out there where it's actually going to help the people that need it. Well, uh, Bill has another question for you, but staying on this ARPA money theme for a moment here, Mike, the governor, as we all know, is very slow to spend the ARPA money early on during the pandemic. And what we were told was we weren't going to spend it until we were 100 percent sure we were spending it the right way because we were afraid the money would then be recalled. We'd have to pay it back. So if you're sure he's misspending it in a way that's not legal, then wouldn't that money be subject to that same recall? Well, the first um, the first pot of money that we got during the pandem- pandemic was actually under the Trump administration. That was the uh, CARES Act. And he definitely misspent that. The money was not meant to be spent on a uh, baby dog sweepstakes. That's how that money was spent, and not all of it. And there's still issues. I think there was an article recently down here in um, the, I can't which which, uh, which publication about how that money was misspent. Um, if you look at the the the, the guidelines uh, for ARPA, it's actually more broad than the CARES Act. Um, and while they might be able to make a case that they could spend this on basically giving it to putting it into the business community, a lot of out of state businesses. It's definitely not within the in the spirit of the bill. The, the money is supposed to go to help communities that have been impacted by COVID and the most distressed and marginalized communities. I don't think that it's the proper uh, use of that money to put it in an economic impact fund. Uh, Michael, he proposed $250 million to support state labs. Uh, do you know what he means by this? Is it going to be coordination between the labs? Is he going wanted to, be... to get them all under one roof. It sounds oh, like a new, right? a new oh, facility. Okay, okay. Yeah, and that is bipartisan support for that. Yeah. Uh, our labs are uh, are in, in great need of, uh, of improvement. We hear that from uh, from the state police all the time. Um, and yeah, that that's something he's going to have some uh, broad support for. Mike Pushkin, final thought is yours. Um. 
Well, I would go back to the uh, the um, the governor made a lot of promises. Uh, he definitely sounds like somebody who's planning on running for uh, for another office, for a higher office. I, I can hear this, his first campaign ads now that uh, you know he uh, was, was able to you know, cut the income tax in half while doing all this new spending. Uh, but unfortunately, what he's going to be doing is leaving uh, his uh, the next governor in a, with a big mess, and the rest of the state with a big mess. So I, I would, you know, we're going to be open minded. We're going to. Uh, work with uh, work across the aisle to do uh, the, the best policy for our, our constituents. Um, however, we've got to be responsible, and we've got to really look at, uh, at some of these proposals and to see how they're going to be paid for. Mike Pushkin, thank you so much.